living the American dream. That was one of the things that was so intriguing to have this kind of violence, this kind of tragedy visited on such a, an all-American couple. That was what really turned the story for us at the beginning. Obviously, this is not, for example, a sudden infant death, which is a natural death. It's not uh, a death by accident. It's not a death by suicide. So it's a homicidal death. And when I begin the examination, there is no gunshot wound. There's no stab wound. There's no battering. And the inner lip showed changes that I associated with someone placing their hand over the nose and mouth and causing suffocation. The external appearance was that there was no decomposition. When I looked internally, and then I even had to look microscopically at those internal organs to see this, but there was early decomposition beginning, but it was a little bit more advanced than externally. He made the statement to the FBI that uh, during the time that Heather was reported missing and the time she was found, that they had had the longest and longest lasting and best sex that they'd ever had. And that is such a startling state to me. I couldn't. I don't believe the other people involved in the case could really uh, think that would be a normal response. Paula says that she saw the guy outside, that the guy made her come inside, that he gave her instructions inside, that once she was inside, he hit her and she gestured, Paula gestured, with a karate chop on the back of the neck, and that knocked her out and she was out for about 45 minutes, and that she remembered getting hit. And I said, is that possible? And I remember Mary Case thought about it very carefully, and she sort of leaned back in her chair, and she said, now that's impossible. When Paula brought the little girls home from the hospital, she was uh, essentially ousted from the, the marital bed. Uh, in the first case, she and Lorelei slept in the basement, which, which was where the family room was. It was a walkout basement. The evidence clearly suggested that uh, boys were fine, little girls were not welcome. We were told repeatedly by witnesses that Robert adored the little boy and was uh, just completely uninterested in the little girls, even in the hospital after their births. One of the comments that Paula made to one of her friends was that uh, these sleeping arrangements are going to have to stop or I'm going to have to do something about it. It was very premeditated, very well thought out, very cold-blooded, very systematic. As you walk through the Sims home, it was very apparent they had a boy that they were very proud of. It should be very normal for a couple. But as you look around the house, there was absolutely no indication whatsoever that they even had a daughter. There weren't any baby pictures. There weren't any pictures at all uh, on the tables or around the walls or whatever to indicate that they had a, a baby at all. I think it's a tragic event to... Uh, any time in society when a parent comes to the point that they are so frustrated for whatever reason that they uh, decide to take the life of one of their children. Well, any time you've got the death of two, and I might add very beautiful, perfect little girls, it's a very sad case. When you add the element that their mother killed them, it gets even worse. On the other hand, justice prevailed. She did it. She murdered her child. She was tried by a jury of her peers. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that she did it. I haven't forgotten, Robert. But not enough evidence right now, and uh, I still have the case filed. Hello, welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Good evening. And the episode that we have today is No Girls Allowed. And it's the Paula Sims story. So it's a story of a woman who had two daughters that were, according to her, kidnapped on separate occasions. So my question to everyone now is, does lightning ever strike twice? Paula Sims claimed that it did. In June of 1986, while Paula was watching television, a masked gunman entered her home, made her lie on the floor, and fled with her 13-day-old daughter, Lorelai Marie. Then, in April of 1989, Paula was confronted by a masked gunman while she was taking out the trash. He ordered her into the house, and once inside, he knocked her unconscious. When she woke, her six-week-old daughter, Heather Lee, was gone. Her 15-month-old son was unharmed. Now, abductions of infants from their own homes are very rare, so how did this happen, not once, but twice, to the same family? This is the topic of this episode of True Crime Brewery, No Girls Allowed. 
Now before I read some five star reviews, I'd like to say hello to Barbara. Barbara's been dealing with a lot this season and we want her to know that we're thinking of her. She's a very loyal TCB listener and we appreciate that. So Barbara, welcome to the brewery. Barbara, good to have you here. Also, for our hardcore true crime listeners, I wanted to share that there is a cool new podcast called True Crime All the Time. This is done by Mike Ferguson. Now this podcast is a real long-term passion for Mike that has come to fruition through a lot of hard work. I've listened to the first three episodes and they were excellent, so we wish all the best for Mike and his podcast. So let's read a couple of five-star reviews and get the beer poured. How does that sound? We'll do that. I got a good beer for tonight. I bet you do. So the first five-star review I'm going to read is called Smart and Fun. It's by Sweet Time 88 This true crime podcast is both smart and fun. The sultry tone of Jill and the raspy skepticism of Dick are just the right balance for true crime equilibrium. <laughs> Thanks, Jill and Dick. Well, that's a nice one. I like that. Yeah. And the next one is Low Key and Thoughtful by Len138. I'm really enjoying the research in this one. I love the idea of someone's parents hanging out together and talking over true crime. Sounds like a nice, the kids have gone to college kind of hobby to me. I love it when J and D disagree. They're polite, but the long-term vibe is dryly funny. I find their take on the South to be a little dated slash questionable. North Carolina is one of the U.S. immigration hubs, and have you ever been to Atlanta? But that's a small quibble. I especially like hearing Dick's professional take on the cases. The Munchausen case was particularly fascinating. Overall, a really engaging, low-key podcast. Well, that's us, engaging and low-key. Absolutely. So, Len138, welcome to the brewery. Welcome, Guy. And I'm going to read one more because we have a lot, because our listeners have been very kind to us. And this is my favorite smiley face by Kinding327. Absolutely adore Jill and Dick and their well-researched cases. I listen to various true crime podcasts, and this is the one I wait for. Dick has great insight on the medical side, and Jill really does her homework on the cases. I would love to hang out at the quiet end of the bar with them and enjoy a beer and a story. So, Kinding327, welcome to the brewery. Yes, welcome. You can hang out with us anytime. Come at the on quiet down to end. the quiet end anytime. You bet. Yes. So, what do we have for our beer today? We have a beer called Navaja, N-A-V-A-J-A. It's brewed by Half Acre Beer Company out of Chicago. Now, in looking up this beer, I never heard of Navaja, so I googled that. turns out that Navaja is a Spanish folding knife, kind of like a switchblade. Oh, huh. So I don't know if it's because the beer is sharp or what, but anyway. Navaja is a double or imperial IPA which by now we know means that it's a really bigger version of a straightforward IPA. It's more hoppy, more alcoholic. So this one pours a hazy gold color with a moderate-sized white head that pretty much lingered the whole time I was drinking the beer. It has a nice aroma of citrus and tropical fruit. Taste is even better. Grapefruit, melon, mango, lots of caramel. So it's, it's pretty balanced. It's, it's hoppy, but not terribly hoppy. And it is 10% alcohol, so you get that warming sensation from the alcohol. But it's certainly not obtrusive. Uh, complimentary, yes. Obtrusive, no. So this is a very nice beer. It's gotten some good ranks, good ratings from beer people. I think you all should try it. Okay. Thanks, Dick. Let's open it. Okay. Okay, Dickie, let's head on down to the quiet end. Let's do that. And it truly is the quiet end tonight. I think yes. it's the post-Christmas, pre-New Year's lull. Yes, I uh, think so. I think there's like three people in the whole bar. So we pretty much got the place to ourselves. That works out great for us. It does. Yep. And I'm really anxious to talk about Paula Sims because well, it's a haunting tale. It is. Yeah. So let's get started. Okay, let's go. 
Now, Robert and Paula Sims, they lived a quiet, um, some might say even reclusive life. The public first heard of them in the summer of 1986. On the night of June 17th, Jersey County Sheriff's deputies were called to the Sims' suburban Illinois home for a report of a child abduction. Paula Sims told police her husband was at work when a masked gunman came into her basement, told her to lie on the floor, and fled with her 13-day-old baby girl, Lorelai. I just did what he said, Paula told police in the hours following the alleged abduction. Police launched a massive search. Reporters broadcasted descriptions of Lorelai and the abductor. Paula and Robert Sims volunteered at that time to take polygraph tests. So following the lie detector tests, Robert Sims announced to the public that he and Paula had passed the tests with flying colors. But the Jersey County investigators had different results. Yeah, they failed miserably. Yeah, according to the polygraph examiner, said Jersey County Sheriff Frank Yoakum, all of the questions were not answered truthfully Yeah. by them. Yeah. All of the questions were not answered truthfully. They, they failed every single question. Right. But let's go back a little bit. I want to get a bit of an understanding of who Paula Sims was and who Robert was and what led us to this point. Okay. Now, Paula was born in 1959, and she was the youngest child with two older brothers. So Dennis, who was born in 1955, he had developed a seizure disorder after being ill with the measles when he was three years old. His seizures were disabling and would occur without warning. And then Randy, who was born a year later in 1956, he was idolized by Paula. He grew into a handsome, popular boy. He had a lot of dates, and as Paula's big brother, Randy just teased her relentlessly, but he also took the time to play basketball with her, and the two looked a lot alike, some people say. Her hair was a bit more auburn, his was more brown, but they looked a lot alike. Now, as Paula entered her teen years, she began spending time with Randy and his friends. She pulled away from her friends and started hanging out with the older crowd, and she started using some marijuana, some alcohol, and maybe even some other drugs, we're not sure. But it was that time, right? Right. Yeah. But Paula never got into trouble in school. She played on the school girls' softball team, and she really stood out as a basketball player on the basketball team. And it was during basketball games when Paula was known to have a bit of a temper. So when she became angry over a call by a referee or the actions of another player, she could act out and get a little bit violent. But it was just kind of seen as passion for the game. Right. Right? So one of Paula's boyfriends was actually Randy's best friend, and they all smoked pot together. But no other drugs were involved, according to him. He described her as not being a real truthful person, though, and not above telling a lie here and there if it would do her some good, keep her out of trouble. Well, yeah, plus she's hanging out with the older kids. She wants to make some kind of impression. Yeah. So that impression of Paula was pretty common. And the mother of one of Paula's girlfriends said that Paula would actually just lie right to your face. And friends from school said Paula liked to party. And she was drinking and smoking some pot um, from the time she was a freshman in high school. So the time she was like 14 or 15 years old. Mm -hmm. But she would picked this up a lot from her, her brother Randy and his friends. Right. So on April 10th of 1976, Randy borrowed a friend's car. And he took Paula for a drive. Now, he may have wanted to talk to Paula about her current boyfriend because at that time she was seeing a man who would end up in prison on drug and weapon convictions, and Randy didn't approve of him. And they were speeding along a road on the western edge of town when Randy lost control of the car, and then he crashed head-on into another car, and they ricocheted off into a tree. Now, with this accident, Randy's skull was crushed, and he died instantly, and he was only 19. Paula, who was then 16, was sitting beside him. Now, she did suffer some severe injuries and was hospitalized, but she was able to get out of the hospital and attend her brother's funeral. So there's some guilt there, huh? She, mm. She's with her brother. They're having a discussion. Yeah. And the car crashes and he dies. Right. And the accident report said that Randy was intoxicated at the time of the crash. Mm-hmm. 
and it listed drinking and drugs as contributing factors to the accident. Right. So Paula was never the same after the crash, which is understandable. She withdrew from everyone, and to some, Paula never seemed happy again. She may have held herself responsible for the crash. Paula's family felt that Paula was in severe emotional pain, but she would rarely allow herself any outward display of emotion. So she was kind of pushing it all down. And she never cried for Randy at his funeral. She was there, and she looked quite somber, but she didn't allow herself to cry in front of other people. It's kind of foreshadowing. Yeah, you know? yeah, right. Because when she's discussing the disappearance of her two daughters, she's very stoic. No, she seems to be, yeah. No tears, no emotion. Yeah, that's something they use against her. Yeah. Now, years later, a rumor surfaced about Paula and Randy that was also disturbing to her and could have caused some emotional problems. Now, according to an FBI report, a trooper with the highway patrol who had participated in the investi investigation of the fatal crash said that he'd been told at the scene by a police officer from La Plata that he had found the brother and sister committing a sex act in Randy's parked car one night. So the FBI tried to confirm that report. If Paula had suffered some kind of sexual abuse or some trauma as a girl, even in a consensual sexual relationship with her brother, it could provide some clue to a psychological injury that could affect her as she was an adult later on. But the agents weren't able to find any supportive information on that story. So there was just the one policeman who said that. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like some salacious gossip, you know? Yeah, there's really nothing to back that up. No. So they did interview every current and former policeman who worked in La Plata in 1975 and 1976, but no one claimed to have any knowledge of any kind of sexual incident between the two. And the family moved from La Plata a month after Randy died, and Paula finished her senior year at the Civic Memorial High School. And there she lettered in girls' softball, but she didn't play basketball anymore. She quit basketball right after Randy's death. That could be because she kind of related basketball to her relationship with Randy. They used to play together. Yeah, I think so. But she did make one close friend after the move, and this friend's name was June Bland. And June said that Paula was a very caring person, but that she was haunted by her brother's death. So... They once visited La Plata together, June said, and Paula took June on a route com commemorating the tragedy of Randy's death. And they visited the spot along the road where the accident happened. They went to the cemetery. Paula confided to June that Randy's death had been very devastating to her. Now, she and Randy had been best friends, she said, and Paula seemed to keep her emotional guard up at all times after June had met her. So the pain she felt at Randy's loss wouldn't be repeated by getting, you know, close to anyone. That was what June thought. So she kept everyone at a safe distance. And then after graduation, June and Paula decided to become computer operators. And they attended Lewis and Clark Community College for a year, but neither of them ended up finishing that program. Yes, yeah, so they, they didn't complete the program. Paula went to work as a cashier at a national food store in a small town called Godfrey in 1978. To some of the other employees, she seemed pretty standoffish and just plain weird. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't friendly with the customers, as the other employees were. She never discussed her personal life. There were moments of a hostile and threatening Paula also. One cashier was convinced that Paula had slashed her tires the night after she and Paula quarreled at work. Another worker once accused Paula of stealing some money from her purse. Yeah. So they painted a picture of a quiet young woman who was prone to violent and angry outbursts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now Robert grew up in what seems to have been a normal family. He lived in a small town in Illinois. He had two older brothers, and he had a younger sister. Now, an older sister had died less than a day after she was born, prematurely. His father was a school teacher, and he moved the family to Alton in 1958 to teach elementary classes and music in the public schools. Now, the neighbors remember the Sims kids as being pretty quiet. Robert liked to work with tools and build models. He wasn't a jock at all. And in high school, he was kind of a B and C student, nothing exceptional. 
but he graduated like smack dab in the middle of his class, and he graduated in 1970. He also played the tuba, and he was in the chorus. Now Robert dropped out of college, and then he enlisted in the Navy, and that was in 1972. Now although he would later tell Paula he was having flashbacks and nightmares from his service in Vietnam, Robert actually served most of his three-year tour at the Naval Air Station at Brunswick, Maine. Now, although his military records carry no disciplinary actions, the Navy was uninterested in his continued service, which is unusual. Yeah, would they say he was not eligible for re-enlistment or something like that? I mean, yeah, not eligible for re-enlistment due to his negative attitude toward the Navy. Yeah. So that's kind of weird. So they didn't want him. No. But he was in Maine, so he met a Brunswick resident girl named Martha Smith. So she was 17 and he was 21 when they got married in 1974. So they were pretty young, especially her. I guess. And she returned to Alton with him when he left the Navy in 1975. And then he went back to a job he'd had before as a loan collector at the local credit union. But now his co-workers, who were mostly women there, they saw some changes in him from before and after he returned from the Navy. I mean, it was really obvious that he didn't like taking orders from the women, who were his bosses and that included his direct supervisor. And one co-worker believed that Robert's apparent trouble dealing with women as authority figures stemmed from a problematic relationship with his mother when he was living at home. And we don't really know much about that, but we know that the real problems began in 1976, when a woman whose desk was next to Robert's became the victim in a series of really strange incidents there. Really strange doesn't begin to describe them. Yeah. So her sandwich would be smashed when she went to get it for lunch, or her soft drink might have been poured out into her desk drawer. Also, obscenities were spray-painted on her car, and she received some hang-up calls for several weeks. After she went to the police, the telephone company tapped her line, and two hang-up calls were traced to the home of Robert Sims. But Robert's wife at the time, Marty, she took the rap for him and said that she'd been just jealous of this person and that she'd made the calls herself. So eventually those charges were dismissed. It's but, a, a very nice wife to do that, to take him the fall. Well, nice or in need. I mean, maybe she needed him to have that job. Yeah. But the woman at the office was convinced that Robert had made the calls, and eventually the credit union manager gave Robert a choice. He could either quit or he could be fired. So he ended up quitting that job. Good choice. <laughs> now, Robert had personality problems at his next job as well. He was only there 18 months, and then he moved on to a job as a laborer at the Jefferson Smurfit plant. So over the years, he developed this reputation among some co-workers as this chronic complainer, and his complaints were really kind of unfounded. And one co-worker described Robert as being very quick to anger and told of Robert harassing a woman at work by putting a used condom and a cockroach in her sandwiches. So that's gross. Ew. I don't know how they knew it was used, and I don't want to know, but yuck. So Robert's first wife, Martha, who had covered for him, said he was way too domineering, and she returned to Maine in 1978, and they got divorced. And then Robert had a brush with the law in 1979 because he was arrested for shoplifting. What he'd done is he'd taken two screwdrivers and a chainsaw chain from a hardware store. A, a big heist. <laughs> yeah. He pled guilty, and he was only fined $100. Okay. Of course, it was a misdemeanor. Yeah. But still, it showed a little something about his character, I think. Well, no kidding. Yeah. So Paula and Robert met through uh, a mutual friend shortly after 1979. Mm-hmm. They dated for a couple years and got married on May 2nd, 1981. And Paula was 22. Robert was 29. Yeah. So Paula was young. She was quite young, yeah. And she's never been married. Robert's been married. Yeah. But I but I did read something about that she didn't know he'd been married before until after Not till they were after, married for a while. Right. Yeah. Oh, by the way, dear, I forgot to tell you I've been married before. Right. But it was incidental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here they are as newlyweds. They bought a house. 
uh, Paula's job at the National Food Store ended in December 1983. So she actually worked there for about five years. She was there a while, yeah. D- despite, for a young person, that's yeah, a long time. But yeah. the, you know, and that's despite her moods and behaviors. Yeah, yeah. But the, she left the store in December 83. Um, actually, was probably fired because it turned out Paula was ringing up amounts of groceries for friends and ringing them up for lower prices than the mark prices. So she was given the family discount, or right. the friend discount. Yeah, right. So the manager used a hidden camera to watch Paula as she rang up about $200 worth of groceries for $50 for another employee that she worked with. So she had friends there, apparently. You're not going to just do that for anybody, right? Well, I don't know. Well. I mean, Maybe she was doing it to try to gain friends. Well, maybe. But you just think if she's this weird person that no one wants to hang out with, but she's doing this for someone, she wasn't quite as weird and estranged as they're saying. She was more in the group, I th- I would think. Yeah. Unless they were taking advantage of her. I think you her. could look at it as them taking advantage of her. Maybe. I mean, if I can get a 75% discount on my groceries, that's a good deal. Yeah. Well, the manager later called her at home, and he told her she was fired, so she did lose her job over that. Yeah. So it was June 17th, 1986, as they were watching the 10 o'clock news, that this couple, Minnie and Don Gray, who were in their mid-50s, they heard a woman's shrill voice outside of their living room window. Minnie squinted through the peephole in her door, but she couldn't see anyone. Then she yelled defensively, Who is it? And an urgent voice replied, It's Paula, let me in. So Minnie knew who Paula was, and she opened the front door, and Paula stumbled in. Yeah, they were next-door neighbors, right? Yeah, but there was quite a distance between the houses. It's kind of rural. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Paula seemed hysterical. She said, Help me, help me, they stole my baby. And Minnie was shocked by this. She's like, Who did? What happened? Didn't make any sense to her. And Paula seemed to have difficulty breathing. She was kind of hyperventilating, and she bent over with her hands on her knees. And Minnie led her over to a chair to kind of sit her down and figure out what the heck's going on. Right. And also the husband, Minnie's husband, Don. Yeah. I mean, these folks were getting ready to go to bed. Yep. And he was walking through the house, locking up and stuff. He didn't hear anything. No, he had looked outside, actually, and he hadn't seen anything going on near Paula's house. Right. Right. And this is pretty close proximity to the time that Paula showed up hysterical. Within a few minutes, yeah. yeah. So Paula told Minnie that she was watching the news downstairs in her house when a man with a mask and a gun came in and told her to lay on the floor for ten minutes or he would kill her. So she said she did what he said. And when she heard him leave, she started to run after him. And then she saw that he'd taken her baby out of the bassinet. So Paula said she ran outside, and she saw a shadow running down the driveway, and she heard some footsteps in the gravel, and she chased him out to the road, but she couldn't see him anymore. He was gone, and so was her little baby Lorelei. So while Don was calling the police, Paula insisted on running back to the home and calling her husband Robert. Yeah, he was at work. Yes. At his regular job. Yep. Now, Minnie worried for Paula's safety because there'd just been, you know, an intruder at her home, and she's running back there. Mm -hmm. So Minnie actually threw on some jeans and ran after Paula. And the thing was with Minnie that she'd become kind of close with Paula over the past year. So neither of the women had an outside job, and they would spend time talking about their families, their husbands. They shared recipes. They talked about their children because Minnie had two children she'd raised to adulthood. Right. Minnie was like a surrogate mother. Kind of, yeah. And Paula often sought Minnie's advice on things with her pregnancy. Yeah. So Minnie had not been in much contact with Robert Sims, because he was a shift worker, and he slept and worked odd hours. So he might be sleeping during the day, working in the evening. You never really knew what with him. Right, and he didn't particularly want people at his house anyway. No, he was right. a bit of a recluse. And you were, you had mentioned that before, that they were on the reclusive side. Yeah. Now, Minnie remembered the day that Paula had come to announce that she was pregnant to her. 
and Minnie had enjoyed sharing in some first-time mother worries and joys with Paula. And the thing about Robert was, even though she didn't see him much, he seemed like a friendly, okay type of guy. And Paula had called Minnie from Alton Memorial Hospital to tell her when she gave birth to Lorelei on June 5th. So as she reached the door of the Sims house, Minnie could see Paula, and Paula was standing in the dining room, and she was already on her phone. She was crying into the phone, They stole my baby, they stole my baby. And when she hung up the phone, she told Minnie, I just told Rob, and he's on his way home. Now, so she didn't call the police? No, the, but Don the, called the police. And she knew he was calling the police? I believe so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, the Sims um, had a female collie named Shadow, and when Minnie got to the house, Shadow slipped out the door as Minnie opened it, and Shadow ignored Minnie's pleas to get back inside the house. So Paula had ran past Minnie and pulled Shadow back into the house. And she said, I just lost my baby. I can't lose you, too. So huh. that was a little bit weird, but okay. I get it, right? I guess. I guess. A young person, not so mature, could say something like that. Mm -hmm. Now Minnie was a little curious because she asked where the dog had been when the kidnapper had struck. Because the dog barked. Well, you think the dog would bark. Well, I, but it didn't bark. Nobody the heard abduction. it bark, no. But the dog was known to bark. Yes, the dog was known to be pretty protective and a pretty good watchdog. Yeah. So, Paula said that the dog must have been in one of the other rooms in the basement when the kidnapper came. And Minnie wondered out loud how the kidnapper had gotten into the house. But Paula just shrugged and shook her head. And then she pointed to the screen door, and she said that she'd locked it before she went downstairs to the family room with the baby. So Minnie stepped toward the door, and she saw that there was a small rip in the screen near the handle. So Minnie said to Paula, this is how he got in. And Paula looked surprised, and she said, I didn't think anyone would do that. I thought I was safe. So Paula, at that point, ran back upstairs and looked around for the baby again. And Minnie looked at the bassinet, and she thought it was strange that the blanket in the bassinet was folded back perfectly. There was nothing disrupted. So if someone had grabbed the baby from the bassinet, there was not a wrinkle or anything. It was perfectly nice. And she thought she thought of feeling for warmth in the bed, but she didn't do that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's starting to be some red flags already Yes. In, in this abduction. No barking dog. The next-door neighbors, granted, they live a ways away, but nothing from them about any disturbance next door. No, nobody saw a car or heard a car. Right. Right. The bassinet was virtually undisturbed. I yes. Mean, I'm there to snatch your baby. The, well, the blanket's not going to be arranged neatly. Well, the thing about their house was, I guess it was incredibly neat. It seems like um, Robert had some OCD, some real control issues. And the house was particularly neat. But nothing was disturbed from this person coming in. Right. So that was kind of odd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the story already doesn't really sound real. Well, I mean, how often does something like that really happen anyway? It's odd that that would even happen. Right. As you mentioned before, infant abductions are pretty rare. Yeah. And and this is not the big city. This is rural Illinois. So the the crime rate is pretty tiny. Pretty tiny. Yep. They don't have money. There's nothing significant as far as enemies or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, Robert's been called. He's left work. He's right. He's beating ass back home. Um, Fifteen minutes after he left work, he's pounding on the door of a friend named Dave Heistan. And Dave opened the door, and Robert collapsed on the living room floor. He's hysterical. Hmm. I can't drive any further. you got to help me. Someone stole my baby. All the way home, as Dave drove them faster than he ever had, Robert cried and sobbed. David known Robert for years, mm -hmm. and this was a side of Robert he'd never seen before. Well, hold the phone here. Now, I'm thinking if I'm in a hurry to rush home for something like this, the idea of stopping at someone's house for a ride is just going to delay things. So right. if you're frantically trying to get home, no matter how distraught you are, why would you stop at someone's house to help you? You wouldn't. I, you'd that's odd home. to me. Or before you leave work, you say to one of your coworkers or something, 
I just got this call. My baby's been kidnapped. I'm, I'm so frightened. I can't drive. Can someone drive me? I still don't think that's normal. I think you frantically want to get home. You're going to jump in that car and drive yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, well, I don't think you're going to stop. No. On, on the way. That's odd. That's I, very odd. I think odd. either you're going to get it home as quick as possible or, or you get a ride from someone at work. Right. If you don't think you can drive. Yeah. Right. But most people wouldn't be that perceptive to know they couldn't drive. No, they I wouldn't. I mean, that adrenaline kicks in. You just want to get there. You and don't even, care how. Even if you're driving and, and you're having panic attacks and stuff, I'd still be heading home. Well, because all you can think of is, i got to get there, i got to get there. And to stop at someone's house, I mean, if you have to pull over a street or two, no fucking way would I do that. Because nope. I'd be like, well, that's going to delay my getting there. So that's unusual to me. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So meanwhile, Deputy John Hazelwood took a call at about 1027 from Don Gray, who's the next-door neighbor, yep. reporting a kidnapping. Deputy told Don that he would get a deputy there as soon as possible. And Don promised to stand by the f end of the driveway with a flashlight because... That's pretty rural. Pretty rural, pretty dark. Yeah. So that way they could find where to go. Right. Yeah. So when they got there, Minnie was showing a deputy the crime scene, and Don Stewart started the um, first official interview with Paula Sims. So she was sitting at the dining room table... But she was difficult to understand, and she kept covering her face with her hands. She said, someone stole my baby, and she repeated that over and over, please get my baby back. Now, her description of the kidnapper was really lacking in detail. He was a man. He was about six feet tall. He was wearing dark clothing and a mask. Yeah. He, now, he had a medium build and a deep voice. She couldn't describe the handgun, whether it was a revolver or a pistol. Or if it was black or silver, she really couldn't say. I, I don't think that's too meaningful. I mean, it's a gun. But yeah, she she but couldn't tell whether he was Caucasian or African American. No. She had no idea. And she, she gave a really vague description. It was vague, yeah. It was very vague. Which might be understandable. I don't know. If you're in that kind of situation, how you're really going to be paying attention to detail, I don't know. So I really can't judge her on that. But it wasn't very helpful to them. No. So when Deputy Hazelwood entered the house, he noticed that there was this four-inch L-shaped hair in the screen door near the handle. And the police offered to notify Paula's parents of what was going on, but she insisted that no one tell them yet. She said that her mother was nervous and might not be able to handle the shock of all this. Which... I could kind of see that if you're in denial and you think, well, everything's going to be okay. It's going to work out. Sure. But her I husband hasn't that. arrived home yet either. No. So you think she might want someone with her? Yeah. Yeah. So Sheriff Frank Yoakum pulled into the Simpsons driveway around 11 p.m. So that's like half an hour later. They've been there half an hour. Yeah. Yep. And he introduced himself to Paula. And he said she was crying, but it was kind of this odd moaning noise and there were no visible tears. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit weird. And Sheriff Yoakum was there, and he watched as Robert Sims arrived at the house. So Robert ran up, and I guess that Paula was crying, but he didn't really hold her. And Sheriff Yoakum found it odd that Robert didn't really hug her or try and comfort his distraught wife in any way. Yeah. It was just like he arrived home from work. Yeah. So Paula said to Rob at that point in front of everyone, she said, Rob, I'm so sorry I disappointed you. And Robert quietly answered, you didn't disappoint me. But Paula said, yes, I did. You were disappointed when Lorelai was a girl, and I disappointed you because I didn't stop the man from taking her. So according to Yoakum, Robert looked a little bit unhappy with that and saw that people were listening, and he whispered something into Paula's ear that he couldn't hear. And probably, then, probably something like, stop saying that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then Paula didn't say anything else at that point. Yeah. So Deputy Hazelwood began to draw more information from Robert. He remembered that a light blue Ford Falcon had been parked by the pond next to the Sims's house when he left for work. Because he just left for work at 8.30 that night. So he had some kind of weird shifts he worked. Yeah. So he'd only been at work like two hours. He'd only been hours. gone a couple hours. 
which in a way makes me more suspicious because I'm thinking, oh, she was just waiting for him to go to work. That's what the skeptical part of my mind says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Robert also recounted that he had an angry exchange three days earlier on that Saturday with a man who was driving a dingy green pickup truck. So the stranger had come to the Sims' door to ask about fishing in their pond, and he was upset with Robert when Robert told him it was not allowed. And he said the man was angry and then drove his truck across the front yard on his way out. as kind of like, you know, retaliating, being angry with him yeah. for not letting him fish in the pond. You're not letting me fish in your pond. I'm just going to mark up your yard. Yeah, but I don't think that really tells me the guy's going to kidnap his kid. But it was something, I guess. The other thing he told the detective was that the Simses had received a number of harassing phone calls to their unlisted number since they got home from the hospital. And then whenever Robert would answer, no one would speak, and the caller would hang up. They brought Lorelei home on a Sunday, June 8th, and that she had not, hadn't been out of the house since then. Right. So they're staying close to home base. Yeah. Well, the baby was only not quite two weeks, 13 days. Sure. So that's not unusual. But he seemed to want to make sure that they knew that for some weird reason. Yep. Showing how careful and cautious they are. Maybe that's it. They did get visited by Orville and Nyleen Blue, who were Paula's parents, and they brought their son Dennis. I remember Dennis is the, the boy with the seizure disorder. Yeah. And yep. So, and he lived with his folks because he was incapable of living alone. Yeah, but he was like 30 years old. He was older than Paula. Yeah, he was the second son. Yep. So we've got that. Then the, the police started looking in earnest. They brought three trained tracking dogs to search the Sims's property. Dogs didn't pick up any scent at all around the driveway or the road. The next morning, more dogs came in uh, to search, but again, no success. So that makes it all very suspicious, don't you think? Yeah, they didn't get anything. Because if there's a stranger, they would smell it. Yeah. Yeah. So during the, the search on the 18th, this is the next day, um, police wanted Paula to come down to the station to give a statement. But she protested that she didn't want to leave the house. She couldn't leave the house. Right, right. And I wonder if maybe she had some agoraphobia because she was kind of cooped up a lot. That's a possibility in my mind. The kind of life they lived seemed very reclusive. But according yeah, to... Yeah, I don't know that I'd look at it as agoraphobia. No. I think it's just more hermit-like. Well, what's the difference? Well, they'll still go outside. Hermits. <laughs> agoraphobes don't want to leave the house at all. Well... They're, they're in the house because they don't want people coming over to the house. Well, what's a hermit's thought process? I thought a hermit's process was they want to be left alone and not be around people. Right. Yeah. But they, they can wander and stuff. They don't want to. Well, I don't know that they don't want to. They I, don't, thought, I thought a hermit, they, I think it's similar. I think a hermit and someone with agoraphobia mm -hmm. just wants to be alone in their home, nobody bothering them. And I can say this because I have a touch of it myself. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a, I think, yes, you're, you're right, I guess. Yeah. There is a similarity, but I think a, an agoraphobe just doesn't want to leave the house because of being outdoors. So they're and afraid the, of the wide open. Right. And the hermit okay. is a little bit different in that they don't want to interact with people. I see what you're saying. So an agoraphobic might just be, be more afraid of the outside of their home, where a hermit is more afraid of the people involved in going out. Right. Yeah, but that's I, a very I, fine distinction, I think though. It's splitting hairs. I think so too. I think oh, okay. it's very similar. Yes. I would think they have similar ideas about life. Okay. So, according to a lieutenant from the state police, Paula had said to them, "No, no," about going to the police station. "No, no, I want to be here when they bring her body up." So, what the fuck does that mean? That's like huge red flag. I don't understand. <laughs> what bring her body up? All I can think of with that is the Harrison Ford Michelle Pfeiffer movie. <laughs> yeah. What lies beneath what lies her beneath. body must come up. Mm -hmm. That's what it makes me think of. So you wouldn't say that about a live 
baby or your baby no. bring her body up. That was odd to me. So did that make them want to search the pond? Well, yeah, but then she stuttered and she said, that's not what I mean. I mean my baby is alive and I want to be here when they bring her on the porch. Up, okay. up on the porch. Up on the porch. That's a fast backtrack. Yeah, that's odd. Very. And I'm thinking if she's not super bright, that's just showing you her cards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to find out with the second child how she showed her cards. Yeah. So Lorelai's body was found about a week later on June 24th of 1986. Well, one, one small point. Okay. They found her skeletal remains. Yes. So it wasn't exactly a body. No. It was horrific, really. It was kind of a a vertebrae. Yeah. yeah. A skull. Vertebrae with spine, ribs. And spine and some ribs. How sad. And And it looked like animals had been... After things. Sure. There was evidence of some teeth marks on bones, and they were <sighs> scattered in such a way that, they, you know, they'd been dispersed by something. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's really gruesome. It is gruesome, and the horrific part of that also is that I think maybe she left her there alive. Yeah. Because the baby would die out there pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So that's just, it's such a fragile creature. It's yeah. just a horrible idea to think of. No, the the picture I would get yeah. is, is almost that the baby had been thrown there. Yeah, right. And and, then, and hopefully, or I would hope that the baby was dead at the time it was discarded in the woods. I guess. I don't know what's better at that point. It's just horrible. It is. So she was found on June 24th, so that was what? Two and a half weeks later or so? Mm, six days, right? Seventeenth was when she was taken. Oh, yeah, she was born on the fifth, yeah. Yeah, so just a week. So she was born, she was found about a hundred feet north of the rear of the Sims house. So it was near the top of a ravine, and this was a very heavily wooded area with some dense underbrush. And it appeared from the evidence that someone had thrown the baby of Laurel the body of Lorelai, sorry, off the top of the ravine after coming through the Sims's backyard. And as you said, the remains were only skeletal. And also, it's worth mentioning that there was no clothing in the area at all. Right. Yeah. So, so what, what do you, what's the significance of that, do you think? Well, what kind of kidnapper? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to kidnap the child, aren't you going to look for a ransom? Or sell it to somebody. Or keep it and raise it in your own. Or keep it yourself. Why would you kidnap the baby, murder it, and throw it, discard it? Yeah, that, it really made no sense. That doesn't add up. No. Well, they did some police reenactments. And these reenactments revealed that it was impossible for the kidnapper to have run north to the back of the house, dispose of Lorelai's body, and then return, which was south past the house, to be 75 feet down the gravel driveway. And that was the time that Paula came up from the basement and saw and heard this shadowy figure. Right. 75 feet down the gravel so driveway. Physically impossible to be out back, discard the body, and then run around to the front of the house where Paula could see him. Well, sure, it's impossible, but it also makes no sense. Why would anyone do that? No. Right? I just, I can see where... She's giving this story that he's running down the gravel driveway. Sure, if someone's running to a car to take the baby away. But if someone's already taken the baby out to the woods and then comes back down there, even if it was physically possible, it would make no sense. But they found that it was physically impossible to do it. Right. So it's just very suspicious, right? The whole thing. It was. and and then, But Paula had an explanation for that. She did? For how, how the... Reenactment showing it couldn't have happened the way Paula said it did. What was that? She claimed that the abductor returned to her home sometime after the baby disappeared mm -hmm. and climbed the, the ravine in the woods in back of the house to put the infant's body near the ravine. So, so it took the baby somewhere and returned so with the baby. She's saying they, they took the baby and returned and placed the baby's body in the ravine. Okay. That makes no sense. No. No. 
So obvious inconsistencies in Paula's story. Uh, and there is definitely circumstantial and maybe more than circumstantial out of evidence that she was lying. Yeah. The investigation never resulted in any, any charges against either Paula or Rob. Right. And they did. But the police certainly weren't satisfied. Oh, no. No. They, they were convinced. Yeah. So they pretty much felt that she'd gotten away with murder. Right. Yeah. And they did. I mean, one of the things was, how do you know it's the baby's body? Right. Because there's, there's just skeletal remains. And this is 30 years ago. Right. They did some DNA techniques that sound pretty sophisticated for 30 years ago. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit impressive. And ended up saying that there was uh, almost 98% probability that the body was Lorelei. And I think from a, a genetic or DNA standpoint, that's pretty darn good to be able to say that. Right, right. So, but no charges were filed. The, the couple moved away, sold the house. They never actually lived in that house again. No, they didn't. And they moved away and, and settled in Alton. Yes. So then on April 29th of 1989, Paula Sims called police to report that she'd been attacked and that her infant daughter, Heather, was kidnapped. Now, her story was that she was home alone with her 14-month-old son, Randall, and her six-week-old daughter, Heather. Her husband was at work, and Heather was in a bassinet downstairs, and Randall was asleep upstairs. So at this point, I think we need to say a little something about these sleeping arrangements. Okay. So, which, which, are a which little... was the same with Lorelai and with Heather, right? With yeah, both daughters. Both daughters. So... When she had Heather, Randall, and Robert, the dad and their 14-month-old child, slept upstairs in bedrooms. The boys got to sleep upstairs. And yeah. The, the girls slept downstairs. But after Paula had the daughter, the daughter and Paula had to sleep downstairs on the couch and in a bassinet. Mm-hmm. And I'm not quite sure how this all came about, although it seemed to be Robert's rule, right? Well, it turns out that Robert had lots of rules. Yeah. And he was, as you said, obsessive-compulsive. Mm-hmm. Uh, his house was in perfect condition. And when they were investigating things, I mean, his his uh, garage where he had all his tools and stuff, the tools were arranged perfectly. Yes, right. So I can see, in a sense, that he wants to... Uh, be able to be upstairs so he's not disturbed by the baby crying. That's bizarre, though. I know. I said in a sense. Okay. Uh, and if, if mom and baby are downstairs, you know, when the baby wakes and needs to be fed, mom can do it. Now, the interesting thing, though, was when Randall was a newborn, that didn't apply. Well, no, he's a boy. So there was this whole thing about a boy versus a girl, right? Which is what right. we're getting to here. In our Which seemed to be an issue. Slow way. We're yes. getting there. We're circling it. We're circling in on it. We right? are. Right? We're getting there. Yes. So she had Randall. They all were upstairs. But when she had Lorelai before Randall, she was sent into this first floor basement with Lorelai mm-hmm. and, while Robert slept upstairs. Right. And then when she had Heather after they had Randall... Randall and Robert stayed upstairs in the bedrooms while Paula and Heather slept downstairs. And as you said, those were probably just Robert's rules. Yeah, it seemed and, to and be. And not that there was any real reason for doing that. No, I mean, there was actually some talk from Paula yeah. with um, her girlfriend or girlfriends that she had about these sleeping arrangements were bizarre. Right. And how, how long was she going to tolerate it? She didn't it? know how much longer she could tolerate it. Yeah. So I almost think he said that he didn't want the baby girl up there to disturb him, but it seems almost like a sick, weird thing about not having a female baby up there. Oh, doesn't it? It seems really weird. Particularly when you know that the boy was up there. Yeah. Uh, and Paula was allowed to sleep up there with the boy. Well, even in the hospital, there was talk of how excited he was about his son, but he didn't seem very interested when his daughters were born. No. That was bizarre. 
So it was about 10.30 p.m., and Paula was taking the garbage out when she uh, saw a person 10 feet away who was pointing a gun at her. Now the person ordered her to go back into the house, and as she stepped inside the kitchen doorway, she says that she was hit on the back of her head, and she went unconscious at that point. So according to Paula and Robert, she did not regain consciousness until he woke her when he got home from work, and that was about 45 minutes later. So on May 3rd, so what was that, a week later? May 3rd, yeah, uh, four or five days. Okay, so on May 3rd of 1989, Heather's naked body was found, and this was really different. It was found in a plastic trash bag, in a trash barrel at a Riverside Park area in Missouri. But now the park was a drive of less than six minutes from the Sims' home. So even though it was another state, it was close by. Yes. Now witnesses' testimony at the trial revealed that the trash bag was not in the trash barrel at 10.30 a.m., but it was there at 1 p.m. the next day. Now pathologist Dr. Mary Case testified that she had performed the autopsy on Heather. It was her opinion that Heather had died by suffocation, caused most likely by placing a hand across her mouth. She also determined that Heather must have been frozen after she died. So this was shocking. And that Heather's death must have occurred three to four days earlier based on this internal decomposition that she noted. Right. So the lack of external decomposition and the bright red colors on her forehead, cheek, and neck and also from the loss of rigor mortis. So could you explain that a little bit to me? About rigor mortis or? Well, if she's frozen. So what's this lack of rigor mortis? Well, rigor mortis sets in several hours after death. But if the body's frozen, it doesn't? Right. Or, okay. it's, or it's delayed. But it, it takes a while. But rigor mortis, you know, is the stiffening of joints. Right. And then what's it called with the um, with the gravity shows the blood goes to a different area? Liver mortis? Liver, L-I-V-O-R. Oh, okay. Mortis. So blood, once, once the heart stops, there's, the blood isn't pumping, obviously, anymore. Right. So it will settle in the lowest part of the body. The kind of a stasis. Right. So if the, the body is lying on its back, you're going to have red and blue marks on the back. Mm -hmm. If it's lying on the stomach, it's going to be in the face and the chest cavity. Mm -hmm. So this, this baby had redness uh, to indicate that she was face down yes. for a time. But when she was in the trash barrel, she wasn't face down. No, she was face up. Then. Right. So, but she was, and, and the medical examiner could tell that she'd been frozen because the condition of the skin, the integument, was in pretty good shape, but her internal organs hadn't been frozen or, or hadn't froze as much as the... They take longer to freeze? Sure. Ugh. I know. It's horrendous. It's gross. Yeah. So it, they, they were more advanced in terms of decomposition. So when this poor fisherman found the baby's body, it looked pink, like it was kind of... Yeah. Oh, a healthy, you know, an alive baby almost. Almost. Yeah. So that's horrendous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, they knew that the body had been frozen, and so the baby hadn't died right prior to being put in the barrel. The baby no. had been dead for a while. Had been dead for a while. Which was like five days since Yeah. the supposed kidnapping. Right. So, through forensic testing, police traced the trash bag in which Heather's body was found to a roll still in the Sims' house. So, if Paula was telling the truth, the alleged kidnapper removed only Heather and a trash bag from the home and didn't touch or disturb anything else. So, the idea would be that an intruder took Heather and took the trash bag and then smothered Heather, removed her clothing, and put her into the bag then stored her body in a freezer and dumped her into a barrel in Missouri four days later. That's really hard to believe. It is far-fetched, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And this whole trash bag thing is phenomenal. 
and the best way to really get an idea about this trash bag forensics was to watch the Forensic Files episode. Right. Yeah. Because they could tell from the perforations where where it gets pulled off. Yeah. They could tell that it was the next the next bag in the series. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's they pretty... could see that those bags were made within 10 seconds of each other. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, pretty amazing. So that was huge evidence, I think, in this whole thing. It was. It really made the difference. Now, the same difficulty, though, is with the Lorelei case. Uh, these parents are just not offering anything. No. For information. No. Uh, they're continuing to deny, deny, deny. Well, the thing is, if you want to get away with something, that's just what you do. To be devil's advocate here. That's what you do. You don't offer anything. Right. Right. And they're not. And they're not. Right. Well, there's this doctor case, and her autopsy determined that Heather was smothered, and she she figured that out by noting these lacerations on the inside of Heather's lips. These little cuts were a result of something being held against the outside of Heather's mouth, which would push the inside of the lip against the bony gums underneath. Mm -hmm. And a major piece of evidence was the opened roll of black plastic trash bags that Sergeant Richard Wells had remembered seeing on some of the shelves in the basement stairwell at the Sims' house. So the police asked Robert and Paula to come to the station, and that was pretty clever because when they got them to come to the station, they executed this extensive search of their home. Yes. So the focus of the search was the trash bags and the freezer refrigerator in the house. So they found two rolls of the black curbside brand trash bags from Kmart, and each roll contained 50 bags. Now one was open and one was still sealed. They also took two full of trash from the outside of the house. Neighbors and reporters out front of the house, when they saw the police coming in to make this search, they actually cheered. <laughs> so there was this big uproar of cheering as they broke in through a window of the house when people realized that the police that the police were going in for a search of the house. Mm -hmm. Because, need I say, that the public really felt that these parents were needed to be held accountable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can, I can just imagine. I mean, again, the, these are both small towns where these crimes took place. Sure. A lot of gossip. And not just once, but twice. The whole lightning strikes twice right. idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're looking at the real implausibility of the story. Yes. And uh, want to have some closure with finding one or both of them guilty. Well, nothing pisses off a crowd like a baby or a child being killed. Oh, yeah. Just causes an outrage. Now, when agents returned to the room where Robert was being interviewed, they informed Robert that search warrants had been executed in their home. So Robert looked down at the desk at that point, and he slowly shook his head back and forth. And he said, at that point, I've never wanted to believe that Paula was involved in our baby's deaths. But now I think I have to. So Robert told police that if Paula killed them, it wasn't on purpose and that she really needed some psychological help. He also said that Paula had keys to her parents' house and she had access to their home any time. So the thing was that her mom and dad were out of town during this time period and she could have put Heather's body into the freezer while he was asleep, he said. And she could have removed it to um, take it to that trash barrel while he was while he was asleep as well. So the, the theory or the hypothesis is that Paula disposed of the body in her parents' freezer because they were out of town, but then they came back into town because they'd been called about the disappearance of Heather. Which would give reason to the point where she said she didn't want her parents' cup, right? Right. Okay. But she couldn't leave the baby in the parents' freezer if they're coming back to town. No. So she went and retrieved it and put it in her freezer until she disposed of it in the trash can. Right. So during the time the police were searching their home, the baby would have been at her parents' house. But then once the police were done with the search of their home, she would have brought it back and actually had it in their kitchen. Right. And there were times when Paula and her husband Robert were unobserved. They they could have done that. Well, yes, but at this point Robert was saying she could have done it. Right. Right. Yeah, he's he's thinking 
fast here. He's, yeah. He's getting off this boat. Well, he did get off the boat and remained off the boat, so. Yeah. So he, he also asked the, the policeman when he was being interviewed if any tire marks from Paula's car had been found at the access area where the trash can was. And the officer bluffed him and said he couldn't divulge all his evidence. Yeah. So that's pretty clever. Well, it's clever at one point, but then in other things, when you see a false confession, it's like, not clever, it's diabolical. Yeah. So it goes either way. And then, while they're still questioning Robert, attorney Donald Groshon, who was a lawyer who handled Robert's divorce 11 years ago, walked into the police station and asked to be admitted to the interview with Robert. He did. However, he wasn't under arrest, Robert wasn't, and he hadn't asked for a lawyer. So Groshan wasn't allowed in to the interview. No, they were they were actually able to keep him out because of that. Yeah. Yep. Now, it would seem to me if Robert knew his lawyer was out there, he would have said, bring my lawyer in. Sure, but, but if he's not arrested and he's not asking for an attorney, they yeah. don't have to provide that. Robert then told the detective something that would be used against Paula in the trial. <laughs> this is just the ick factor magnified. Really? What did he do? So he, he said that after Heather was kidnapped, Paula and I started sleeping together again. Because remember, oh. she had been banished to the downstairs. Yeah, yeah. And then the Monday or Tuesday night after Heather disappeared, Robert and Paula had the best and longest lasting sex they've had in a long time. Yeah. So that's something I'd want to make sure the cops knew. <laughs> you know, I'd be saying... yeah. Well, yes, my baby daughter's disappeared, but her mom and I had really mind-blowing sex. That's just creepy. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Very creepy. That didn't go over well. No. Didn't earn him well, a lot of points. When she heard that, she wasn't happy. No. So, Robert's starting to come to the logical conclusion that Paula had killed the babies, but he wouldn't come out and actually say, I think she did it. No. But he's throwing her under the bus in many ways. He is, for yeah. sure. yeah. And he uh, kind of disowned her after she was convicted of it. Well, Paula's roommate on the maternity ward came forward, and she said that Paula had described the story of what happened to Heather when the roommate had asked her what happened to Lorelai. Right. She mixed up her stories. Yeah. So it would still be six weeks before Paula would be knocked unconscious, quote, unquote, and have Heather taken. But that's what Paula described to her roommate when talking about how she lost Lorelai. So Paula was arrested actually at her parents' house, and the judge set her bail at $100,000, and Paula's father promptly paid the $10,000 to get her released. Now, suspicious that Heather's body had been stored in Paula's parents' freezer, those suspicions actually received a fatal blow when Orville Blue's brother-in-law so that's Paula's uncle? I believe so. Yeah, and his wife said that they were in the Blues' house that evening and that they cooked meat that they'd gotten from the Blues' freezer. So there wasn't a lot in the freezer, they said, and they definitely would have noticed a dead baby in there. But evidence in Paula's timeline would, la would later reveal that Paula could have actually moved Heather from her mother's freezer while police were searching her house and then brought the baby back to her freezer for the remaining three days before she disposed of Heather's body in the trash barrel. Right. There was plenty of time. Yeah. But this took a while for investigators to figure that out. It, it was did. It was quite complicated. So eventually, they go through the trial, and Paula was convicted of Heather's murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison for that. Right. But they weren't able to convict her of Lorelai's murder. But... Actually, in 1990, after a jury found Paula guilty of Heather's murder, Paula did confess to killing both of the girls. So she said in her confession that it was postpartum depression and that postpartum psychosis led her to kill them. And she also said, I just want to bring awareness and let people know that this is real and I'm not some monster. So she said, the guilt, I'm tormented still to this day by what I did because I really loved my daughters. And she actually did some interviews from prison. Yeah, and, you know, let me just ask. Okay. I mean, do you have the exact same kind of postpartum psychosis, depression psychosis each time? Because she's had know. it twice. Right. right. 
Could you? And, and what about the boy? She didn't have postpartum depression or psychosis with him? Well, I think with that you would say that Robert really had a, had a role in that because of his rules, and a, he put a lot of pressure on her. Okay. I'm just thinking that it's a convenient excuse. Well, of course. To, to blame things on a mental illness. I mean, obviously she's mentally ill because she killed two babies. Um, well, okay. But to to blame... Some would say she's just evil and selfish. Yeah. Well, in prison, Paula Sims said that she heard about postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis, which she hadn't heard of before. And she said that after she spoke with a mental health professional, she now believes that the diseases drove her to kill. And she also said, I'm not trying to make excuses here. A lot of women have been through worse than what I've been through, and they don't do something like this. So I'm a weak woman. Sim said she started hearing voices right after Lorelai was born on June 5, 1986, and Lorelai was killed 13 late, days later. Sims also said she didn't want to talk about that day at all and wouldn't go any further. But, while Sims doesn't want to talk about how she killed her daughters, she does go into detail about how what she says was the feeling she had at the time of Lorelai's birth. So she said she was afraid to say anything to anyone, she was ashamed, and she started having bad thoughts immediately and was confused by them. So it was difficult for her, she said, because she was a very private person and she couldn't see telling someone what she was thinking and what her feelings were about harming her baby. So she said the symptoms were similar but more intense after Heather was born. She said, I was so weak, I hadn't eaten in probably two weeks, and not only had it gotten me emotionally, had it had gotten me physically, and I kept fighting and fighting these voices. I talked to the voices just like I talk to you right now. I paced the house, drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana, smoking a cigarette, and then telling them to leave me alone. I wasn't going to do it. I didn't want to do it. Just leave me alone. I loved her, and I didn't want to hurt her, and the voices would then leave me alone because they didn't have me where they wanted me. Then they'd back off because I wasn't going to do it. I never wanted to do it in the first time, so the voices backed off. She says she tried to tell those closest to her, but for various reasons she wasn't able to. I didn't tell them the thoughts I was having with Heather, because the voices told me, then what about Lorelai? You're going to expose yourself about Lorelai. I had that dark secret that I planned on taking to my grave. I planned on taking what I did to Heather to my grave as well. So Paula Sims said she can't explain how she was hearing and seeing things that weren't there yet she was able to conceal the bodies of her daughters and the fact that she was responsible for their death. So what do you think of all that? You look like you don't believe it. <laughs> well, I mean, there I mean, has there, to be some of that there, right? There, there does have to be some of that. But, I mean, that presupposes that she had no inkling what postpartum depression and psychosis was until she went to prison and learned about it. That's what she's saying, because yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking... This is stuff that should have come out during the trial. And and even if she didn't know what the, the term was, uh, don't you think that she would have talked about hearing voices and all that at the trial? Well, this is there's this whole aspect of Robert and only wanting boys thing that I just can't, I just can't put into perspective with this. Why didn't she have any of this with the boy? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Was she that controlled by Robert? Or was she just as bad as Robert with her feelings about it? I mean, she had told people years before she had her children that she didn't want any girls. Yeah. Didn't which want, is weird. Didn't want girls. Yeah. But could that go back to her brother's death and her feeling that, you know, there was something better about boys than girls? I don't know. Yeah, that's a stretch to me. Yeah. I think we're trying to be... Too psychiatrically oriented. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. Because it did seem in some ways like she did want her daughters. She had second thoughts. Now, when she made the confessions about killing them, she said that she drowned them. Okay. Okay. So she said she she didn't um, hold her hand over their mouths and suffocate them, but she drowned both of them. Okay. 
Well, the first one was just skeletal remains, so who knows. But right. the, the second baby, no evidence that the baby had drowned. There's no water or fluid in the lungs. True. So So she might have been lying about that. I'm pretty sure she was. Yeah. Or, or misremembering. Yeah. Well, the thing that got to me was when I was reading about when she said she drowned the first baby, I think it was. She said that she actually sat there and smoked a cigarette and wanted to stop and go save the baby, but decided, no, I can't do that, but decided, no, I can't do that. This has to happen. Yeah. So that made me sad. That, that's just chilling. Yeah. And then what do you think about Robert's part in this? Do you think he knew she was going to do it? Did he not know until after she did it? What's going on there? Because I'm a little up in the air about that. I certainly don't think he's totally ignorant of everything. No, I I think he had a pretty good idea before he said he thought she was involved, that she did something to the kids, that she did something to the kids. But he was okay with it? Well, I don't think he had enough evidence to sway himself. I mean, he might have had an idea. But he almost encouraged it, right? Oh, yeah. But so I don't, did he? was he happy she did it? I don't know. Oh, boy, that's complicated stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, th I think he wasn't unhappy. How's that? That's well, how could he be unhappy when they had this great sex after? Yeah. Ick. Right? Yeah. But I don't think, I think he was probably suspicious that she was responsible, but not necessarily unhappy that she did it. Right. So he was in a bit of denial. Yeah. But you don't think he had anything to do with I don't think he was that complicit in it. No. I don't. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. Because he seemed to have a pretty good idea of how she froze the baby after. Yeah. So no, why I, didn't he know it back then? I think I think he figured things out. Yeah. And he probably does feel somewhat responsible because of his attitude towards females. Well, I think absolutely. I think that she felt like she needed to do this. I think that he made her feel like she needed to do this. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, so I think he's very culpable. But he didn't tell her to do it. I mean, that's his excuse, right? No, he, but he she didn't... felt pretty much like she was cast out of their relationship when she had these girls. Yeah. It was either them or him. And obviously he had some kind of hold over her, or she would have gotten rid of him from the get-go. Right. Which is what most women would do, because they're going to pick their kids first, right? That's what a mother does. She, her kids come first. They do. Yeah. Not in this case. No. So I think that's what women find so abhorrent. I think whenever a woman puts a man before her children, we as women are very offended. It's the same thing when you find women whose daughters have been sexually abused by their husbands, their boyfriends, whatever. And they and don't they say take, anything. Yeah, and they or, take his side. Or they take the side of like the perpetrator. Like Mrs. Sandusky, even though it weren't that her daughter, but still, to take the husband's side. Yeah. It's a violation against this whole connection that a woman should have with a child where you protect the child above all else. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So I think that I think that women as a whole, myself included, hate a woman who chooses a boyfriend or a husband above a child because the child are looking the children are looking for this protector and that's what we see ourselves as. Mhm. Mm and it's a, just a huge violation in the order of things, to not do that. It sure is. It's just, it's the worst thing ever, really, that a woman can do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, as a, just a sad afterthought, in case you're not sad enough from the story, in June of 2015, Robert Sims, age 63, and Randall Sims, age 27, were killed in a drunk drive, were killed in a drunk driving accident. So their Jeep was forced off the road in Jackson, Mississippi, by a Volvo that was operated by Yolanda McNeely. And Yolanda McNeely was drunk at the time of the collision. So Robert, Robert and Randall were both pronounced dead at the scene. And Yolanda McNeely took off from the scene after the crash. So she was later arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated DUI and felony fleeing. Felony fleeing. Okay. Yep. Because they had died. Yes. All right. Now, I don't really give a shit that Robert died, but I do feel bad for Randall. Well, by all things we've read, he, he actually turned out to be a pretty upstanding person. Yeah. So, Was, so what had he done? Well, he worked in the, active in his church. 
had a good job. He was an engineer or something. Okay. Um, I don't know if he was married or not, but um, he was doing good things. Yeah. And there's no doubt that Robert did love Randall, no, right? No question. I mean, in their house, they had pictures of Randall. Randall was, could do no wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly not Randall's fault that his parents were psych psychopaths. No. So Robert had divorced Paula shortly after her 1990 conviction. And he was never charged, though, in connection with the deaths of Lorelai and Heather, which surprises me. I think that the police really thought they were going to be able to get him for some kind of at least accessory. Yeah. No, yeah. There's no question that they were looking at him hard. Now, Paula did confess to the murders, and she said that she had drowned them, as I said. But she never blamed Robert for the killings, which is surprising. Well, it's back to your theory about women choosing the, the husband, boyfriend, whatever, over the kids. Yeah, so even at that point, she was still under his control. Yeah. That's nauseating. But she did say that there was some pressure from him, she did admit to that, to obey these rules of his house. Yeah. Which I guess having the girls, like even the dirty diapers of the girls were offensive to him. Which, back when he was doing some weird things with the women at work, there was talk of his relationship with his mother. And I don't want to get all Freudian here, but I wonder if he had something with women that stemmed back to his relationship with his mother. That's never going to get answered. No, but it's a possibility, don't you think? Possible. Something going on there. Okay, do you have anything else to add about the case? Not about this case. No. Sad, though, isn't it? Uh, it's one of the saddest. Well, you know, got babies. Well, yeah. But, I mean, even when it's a woman, it pisses me off more. I guess it's I don't expect as much from men, I hate to say. <laughs> but when I think of a woman, I expect a certain sort of sisterhood to be there. And it's when it's not there, I get angry. Well, and I'm just getting angry at somebody who takes things out on defenseless infants. Right. Okay. So... We're together. Yep. So she's in prison. Robert's dead. Right. End of story, I guess. But I want to take a minute before we close to thank all of you who've really come through for us with these five-star reviews. Right, Dick? It's been amazing. It's been fascinating. So we're still at four and a half stars, but we must be right on the verge of five because we've had like 24 five-star reviews in the past week. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, it really means a lot to us. It does. Yeah. I mean, we enjoy doing this, but it, the feedback has been so positive, it makes us want to keep doing it. Yeah, it gives me that encouragement because, you know, I need that, I have to admit. I need the outside <laughs> encouragement. I don't have the, all that internal strength. But anyway, I just think it's great, and I want to thank everyone who's done it. And if you haven't done it, what's what? wrong with you? We don't fucking need you then, right? <laughs> no, we do? We do need you. Okay. We do. But if you like us, please give us a five-star review because we're right on the verge of five and we have five. I'm going to drink two beers real fast and be happy. Okay. <laughs> so if you like the podcast, now's a good time to get it done. You could be the one who pushes us four and a half, five stars. Woohoo! We'll, we'll shout out to you. Yep. And also, Dick, your review of beer contest is coming to a close soon, right? Yeah, just to mention, we've got like four or five days, right? We're Not much, yeah. On January 1st. Yep, so four we've, days. We've gotten some really good reviews. We have. But I obviously would like some more. Dick's going to pick a winner next week. So if you haven't already, call in with your review. You can use our leave a voicemail link at tiegrabber.com. And you could also email it to us at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. We're still open to listening to more. Bring it's not more. too late. No, so... Let's and what do they win? Well, what does the winner get? The winner gets, what, a t-shirt? Drum roll. A snifter. A t-shirt and a snifter. And a coaster. And a coaster. Let's throw in a sticker. Sticker, too? So four you're, items. You're breaking the bank here. <laughs> That's right. So you could really be like True Crime Brewery, you know, total cool... <laughs> In the hood type true crime brewery person. You like could. TCB what? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then true crime brewery can be found, as you probably know, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, and our newest person affiliate type of deal, iHeartRadio. Also, you can always find it on our website, tigrabber.com, and you can subscribe to Tigrabber 
for as little as $2 a month or as much as $5 a month. If you're rolling in the dough, hey, share the love, right? Right. So you can give us some support by using our Amazon link too. And our Amazon link is tigerber.com forward slash Amazon. You know, Christmas is over. It's time to use those gift cards. It's time to make right. those exchanges. Let's buy some stuff. You're going to do that shit. So just do it over tigerber.com slash Amazon instead of Amazon, right? Right. Because there's just... no extra cost to you. Absolutely not. And it's just a total bonus for us. And it'll help us. Yes. It'll improve the quality of our podcasts, right? Of course. <laughs> and it's just a great thing to do. But anyway, the five-star reviews have been awesome. Anyone else that can do it, please do it. We love them. We do. I'm just really always taken aback by how great they are. Because I feel like we're just like this couple chatting about shit on the internet. That's all we're so doing. So when people really like it, I'm like, wow, that's totally cool. Mm -hmm. really means a great deal to me. Well, we have fun doing this. Oh, we do, totally. And, that's and why I, we do it. I think people recognize that. Yes. So. But if we can give other people fun listening... That's just a, a wonderful thing. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Good deal. Okay. So the review of beer contest, we've got like four more days, and then we're going to announce a winner. Are you going to announce the winner next week? Next week or two. I don't know. Might take you a couple it, weeks. It'll be by the middle of January. Okay. And then the gifts will go out immediately. Pretty much near right? immediate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Immediate plus one. I yeah. don't know. Because, you know, I'm about to open a store page, too, so people can buy their own T-shirt and snifter and all that. Right. That'll be out so, soon, too. Look for that. Yep. And as far as our survey, I think we're pretty much set with our survey. Got lots of people who went ahead and did that, so thank you very oh, much. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. So we're wishing everyone a happy and a wonderful new year. 2017. We'll talk up. to you next year, right? Next year. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.